Chapter 7 The following ten days were, as W.C. Fields said, fraught with eminent peril and mad. I moved in with Roland Major in the really swank apartment that belonged to Tim Gray's folks. We each had a bedroom, and there was a kitchenette with food in the icebox, and a huge living room where Major sat in his silk dressing gown, composing his latest Hemingway and short story. A choleric, red-faced, pudgy hater of everything, who could turn on the warmest and most charming smile in the world when real life confronted him sweetly in the night. He sat like that at his desk, and I jumped around over the thick, soft rug, wearing only my chino pants. He'd just written a story about a guy who comes to Denver for the first time. His name is Phil. His traveling companion is a mysterious and quiet fellow called Sam. Phil goes out to dig Denver and gets hung up with arty types. He comes back to the hotel room. Lugubriously, he says, Sam, they're here too. And Sam is just looking out the window sadly. Yes, says Sam, I know. And the point was that Sam didn't have to go and look to know this. The arty types were all over America, sucking up its blood. Major and I were great pals. He thought I was the farthest thing from an arty type. Major liked good wines, just like Hemingway. He reminisced about his recent trip to France. Ah, Sal, if you could sit with me high in the Basque country with a cool bottle of Poignon Dix-Neuf, then you'd know there are other things besides boxcars. I know that. It's just that I love boxcars, and I love to read the names on them, like Missouri Pacific, Great Northern, Rock Island Line. By gad, Major, if I could tell you everything that happened to me hitching here. The Rollinses lived a few blocks away. This was a delightful family. A youngish mother, part owner of a decrepit ghost town hotel, with five sons and two daughters. The wild son was Ray Rollins, Tim Gray's boyhood buddy. Ray came roaring in to get me and we took to each other right away. We went off and drank in the Colfax bars. One of Ray's sisters was a beautiful blonde called Babe, a tennis-playing, surf-riding doll of the West. She was Tim Gray's girl. And Major, who was only passing through Denver and doing so in real style in the apartment, was going out with Tim Gray's sister Betty. I was the only guy without a girl. I asked everybody, where's Dean? They made smiling, negative answers. Then finally it happened. The phone rang, and it was Carlo Marx. He gave me the address of his basement apartment. I said, what are you doing in Denver? I mean, what are you doing? What's going on? Oh, wait till I tell you. I rushed over to meet him. He was working in May's department store nights. Crazy Ray Rollins called him up there from a bar, getting janitors to run after Carlo with a story that somebody had died. Carlo immediately thought it was me who had died, and Rollins said over the phone, Sal's in Denver, and gave him my address and phone. And where's Dean? Dean is in Denver, let me tell you. And he told me that Dean was making love to two girls at the same time, they being Mary Lou, his first wife, who waited for him in a hotel room, and Camille, a new girl, who waited for him in a hotel room. Between the two of them, he rushes to me for our own unfinished business. And what business is that? Dean and I are embarked on a tremendous season together. We're trying to communicate with absolute honesty and absolute completeness everything on our minds. We've had to take Benzedrine. We sit on the bed, cross-legged, facing each other. I have finally taught Dean that he can do anything he wants, become mayor of Denver, marry a millionaires, or become the greatest poet since Rambeau. But he keeps rushing out to see the midget auto races. I go with him. He jumps and yells, excited. You know, Sal, Dean is really hung up on things like that. Mark said, hmm, in his soul, and thought about this. What's the schedule, I said. There was always a schedule in Dean's life. The schedule is this. I came off work a half hour ago. In that time, Dean is bawling Mary Lou at the hotel and gives me time to change and dress. At one sharp, he rushes from Mary Lou to Camille. Of course, neither one of them knows what's going on, and bangs her once, giving me time to arrive at one thirty. Then he comes out with me. First he has to beg with Camille, who's already started hating me, and we come here to talk till six in the morning. We usually spend more time than that, but it's getting awfully complicated and he's pressed for time. Then at six he goes back to Mary Lou, and he's going to spend all day tomorrow running around to get the necessary papers for their divorce. Mary Lou's all for it, but she insists on banging in the interim. She says she loves him. So does Camille. Then he told me how Dean had met Camille. Roy Johnson, the pool hall boy, had found her in a bar and took her to a hotel. Pride taking over his sense, he invited the whole gang to come up and see her. Everybody sat around talking with Camille. Dean did nothing but look out the window. Then when everybody left, Dean merely looked at Camille, pointed at his wrist, made the sign four, meaning he'd be back at four, and went out. At three, the door was locked to Roy Johnson. At four, it was open to Dean. I wanted to go right out and see the madman. Also, he had promised to fix me up. He knew all the girls in Denver. 
Carlo and I went through rickety streets in the Denver night. The air was soft, the stars so fine, the promise of every cobbled alley so great that I thought I was in a dream. We came to the rooming house where Dean haggled with Camille. It was an old red brick building surrounded by wooden garages and old trees that stuck up from behind fences. We went up carpeted stairs. Carlo knocked, then he darted to the back to hide. He didn't want Camille to see him. I stood in the door. Dean opened it stark naked. I saw a brunette on the bed, one beautiful creamy thigh covered with black lace, look up with mild wonder. Why, Sal, said Dean. Well, now, uh, ahem, yes, of course you've arrived. You old son of a bitch, you finally got on that old road. Well, now, look here, we must, uh, yes, yes, at once. We must, we really must. And uh, now, Camille, and he swirled on her. Sal is here. This is my old buddy from New York. This is his first night in Denver, and it's absolutely necessary for me to take him out and fix him up with a girl. But what time will you be back? It is now, looking at his watch. Exactly one fourteen. I shall be back at exactly three fourteen for our hour of reverie together. Real sweet reverie, darling. And then, as you know, as I told you and as we agreed, I have to go and see the one-legged lawyer about those papers. In the middle of the night, strange as it seems, and as I thoroughly explained. This was a cover-up for his rendezvous with Carlo, who was still hiding. So now, in this exact minute, I must dress, put on my pants, go back to life, that is, to outside life, streets and what not, as we agreed. It is now one fifteen, and time's running, running. Well, all right, Dean, but please be sure and be back at three. Just as I said, darling, and remember, not three, but three fourteen. Are we straight in the deepest and most wonderful depths of our souls, dear darling? And he went over and kissed her several times. On the wall was a new drawing of Dean, enormous dangle and all, done by Camille. I was amazed. Everything was so crazy. Off we rushed into the night. Carlo joined us in an alley, and we proceeded down the narrowest, strangest, and most crooked little city street I've ever seen, deep in the heart of Denver Mexican town. We talked in loud voices in the sleeping stillness. Sal, said Dean, I have just the girl waiting for you at this very minute, if she's off duty, looking at his watch. A waitress, Rita Betancourt, fine chick, slightly hung up on a few sexual difficulties, which I've tried to straighten up, and I think you can manage. You fine gone, daddy, you. So we'll go there at once. We must bring beer. No, they have some themselves, and damn, he said, socking his palm. I've just got to get into her sister Mary tonight. What? said Carlo. I thought we were going to talk. Yes, yes, after. All these Denver doldrums, yelled Carlo to the sky. Isn't he the finest, sweetest fellow in the world? said Dean, punching me in the ribs. Look at him, look at him. And Carlo began his monkey dance in the streets of life as I'd seen him do so many times everywhere in New York. And all I could say was, well, what the hell are we doing in Denver? Tomorrow, Sal, I know where I can find you a job, said Dean, reverting to business-like tones. So I'll call on you soon as I have an hour off from Mary Lou and cut right into that apartment of yours, say hello to Major, and take you on a trolley. Damn, I've no car, to the Camargo Markets, where you can begin working at once and collect a paycheck come Friday. We're really all of us bottomly broke. I haven't had time to work in weeks. Friday night, beyond all doubt, the three of us, the old threesome of Carlo, Dean, and Sal, must go to the midget auto races, and for that I can get us a ride from a guy downtown I know. And on and on into the night. We got to the house where the waitress sisters lived. The one for me was still working. The sister that Dean wanted was in. We sat down on our couch. I was scheduled at this time to call Ray Rollins. I did. He came over at once. Coming into the door, he took off his shirt and undershirt and began hugging the absolute stranger, Mary Betancourt. Bottles rolled on the floor. Three o'clock came. Dean rushed off for his hour of reverie with Camille. He was back on time. The other sister showed up. We all needed a car now, and we were making too much noise. Ray Rollins called up a buddy with a car. He came. We all piled in. Carlo was trying to conduct his scheduled talk with Dean in the back seat, but there was too much confusion. Let's all go to my apartment, I shouted. We did. The moment the car stopped there, I jumped out and stood on my head in the grass. All my keys fell out. I never found them. We ran, shouting into the building. Roland Major stood barring our way in his silk dressing gown. I'll have no goings on like this in Tim Gray's apartment. What? We all shouted. There was confusion. Rollins was rolling in the grass with one of the waitresses. Major wouldn't let us in. We swore to call Tim Gray and confirm the party and also invite him. Instead, we all rushed back to the Denver downtown hangouts. I suddenly found myself alone in the street with no money. My last dollar was gone. I walked five miles up Colfax to my comfortable bed in the apartment. Major had to let me in. I wondered if Dean and Carlo were having their heart to heart. I would find out later. The nights in Denver are cool, and I slept like a log.
Chapter 8 Then everybody began planning a tremendous trek to the mountains. This started in the morning, together with a phone call that complicated matters. My old road friend, Eddie, who took a blind chance and called. He remembered some of the names I had mentioned. Now I had the opportunity to get my shirt back. Eddie was with his girl in a house off Colfax. He wanted to know if I knew where to find work, and I told him to come over, figuring Dean would know. Dean arrived, hurrying, while Major and I were having a hasty breakfast. Dean wouldn't even sit down. I have a thousand things to do, in fact, hardly any time to take you down to Camargo, but let's go, man. Wait for my road buddy, Eddie. Major found our hurrying troubles amusing. He'd come to Denver to write leisurely. He treated Dean with extreme deference. Dean paid no attention. Major talked to Dean like this. Moriarty, what's this I hear about you sleeping with three girls at the same time? And Dean shuffled on the rug and said, Oh, yes, oh, yes, that's the way it goes, and looked at his watch, and Major snuffed down his nose. I felt sheepish rushing off with Dean. Major insisted he was a moron and a fool. Of course he wasn't, and I wanted to prove it to everybody somehow. We met Eddie. Dean paid no attention to him either, and off we went in a trolley across the hot Denver noon to find the jobs. I hated the thought of it. Eddie talked and talked the way he always did. We found a man in the markets who agreed to hire both of us. Work started at four o'clock in the morning and went till six p.m. The man said, I like boys who like to work. You've got your man, said Eddie, but I wasn't so sure about myself. I just won't sleep, I decided. There were so many other interesting things to do. Eddie showed up the next morning. I didn't. I had a bed and Major bought food for the icebox, and in exchange for that I cooked and washed the dishes. Meantime, I got all involved in everything. A big party took place at the Rollinses one night. The Rollins' mother was gone on a trip. Ray Rollins called everybody he knew and told them to bring whiskey. Then he went through his address book for girls. He made me do most of the talking. A whole bunch of girls showed up. I phoned Carlo to find out what Dean was doing now. Dean was coming to Carlo's at three in the morning. I went there after the party. Carlo's basement apartment was on Grand Street in an old red brick rooming house near a church. You went down an alley, down some stone steps, opened an old raw door, and went through a kind of cellar till you came to his board door. It was like the room of a Russian saint. One bed, a candle burning, stone walls that oozed moisture, and a crazy makeshift icon of some kind that he had made. He read me his poetry. It was called Denver Doldrums. Carlo woke up in the morning and he heard the vulgar pigeons yakking in the street outside his cell. He saw the sad nightingales nodding on the branches and they reminded him of his mother. A gray shroud fell over the city. The mountains, the magnificent Rockies that you can see to the west from any part of town, were paper mache the whole universe was crazy and cockeyed and extremely strange. He wrote of Dean as a child of the rainbow who bore his torment in his agonized priapus. He referred to him as Oedipus Eddie, who had to scrape bubblegum off window panes. He brooded in his basement over a huge journal in which he was keeping track of everything that happened every day, everything Dean did and said. Dean came on schedule. Everything's straight, he announced. I'm going to divorce Mary Lou and marry Camille and go live with her in San Francisco. But this is only after you and I, dear Carlo, go to Texas, dig old Bull Lee, that gone cat I've never met and both of you told me so much about, and then I'll go to San Fran. Then they got down to business. They sat on the bed cross-legged and looked straight at each other. I slouched in a nearby chair and saw all of it. They began with an abstract thought, discussed it, reminded each other of another abstract point, forgotten in the rush of events. Dean apologized, but promised he could get back to it and manage it fine, bringing up illustrations. Carlo said, and just as we were crossing Wazi, I wanted to tell you about how I felt of your frenzy with the midgets, and it was just then, remember, you pointed out that old bum with the baggy pants and said he looked just like your father? Yes, yes, of course, I remember. And not only that, but it started a train of my own, something real wild that I had to tell you. I'd forgotten it. Now you just reminded me of it. And two new points were born. They hashed these over. Then Carlo asked Dean if he was honest, and specifically if he was being honest with him in the bottom of his soul. Why do you bring that up again? There's one last thing I want to know. But, dear Sal, you're listening, you're sitting there, we'll ask Sal. What would he say? And I said, that last thing is what you can't get, Carlo. Nobody can get to that last thing. We keep on living in hopes of catching it once for all. No, 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 you're talking absolute bullshit and wolfy and romantic posh, said Carlo. And Dean said, I didn't mean that at all, but we'll let Sal have his own mind, and in fact, don't you think, Carlo, there's a kind of a dignity in the way he's sitting there and digging us? Crazy cat came all the way across the country. Old Sal won't tell us, old Sal won't tell. It isn't that I won't tell, I protested. I just don't know what you're both driving at or trying to get at. I know it's too much for anybody. Everything you say is negative. Then what is it you're trying to do? Tell him. No, you tell him. 
There's nothing to tell, I said and laughed. I had on Carlo's hat. I pulled it down over my eyes. I want to sleep, I said. Poor Sal always wants to sleep. I kept quiet. They started in again. When you borrowed that nickel to make up the check for the chicken fried steaks, no man the chili, remember the Texas star? I was mixing it with Tuesday. When you borrowed that nickel, you said, now listen, you said, Carlo, this is the last time I'll impose on you. As if, and really, you meant that I had agreed with you about no more imposing. No, 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 I didn't mean that. You hearken back now, if you will, my dear fellow, to the night Mary Lou was crying in the room. And when, turning to you and indicating by my extra added sincerity of tone, which we both knew was contrived but had its intention, that is, by my play act, and I showed that... But wait, that isn't it. Of course it isn't, because you forget that... But I'll stop accusing you. Yes is what I said. And on, on into the night they talked like this. At dawn I looked up. They were tying up the last of the morning's matters. When I said to you that I had to sleep because of Mary Lou, that is, seeing her this morning at ten, I didn't bring my peremptory tone to bear in regard to what you just said about the unnecessariness of sleep. But only, only, mind you, because of the fact that I absolutely, simply, purely, and without any whatevers have to sleep now. I mean, man, my eyes are closing. They're red hot, sore, tired, beat. Ah, child, said Carlo. We'll just have to sleep now. Let's stop the machine. You can't stop the machine, yelled Carlo at the top of his voice. The first bird sang. Now, when I raise my hand, said Dean. We'll stop talking. We'll both understand purely and without any hassle that we are simply stopping talking and we'll just sleep. You can't stop the machine like that. Stop the machine, I said. They looked at me. He's been awake all this time listening. What were you thinking, Sal? I told them that I was thinking they were very amazing maniacs and that I had spent the whole night listening to them like a man watching the mechanism of a watch that reached clear to the top of Berthoud Pass and yet was made with the smallest works of the most delicate watch in the world. They smiled. I pointed my finger at them and said, If you keep this up, you'll both go crazy, but let me know what happens as you go along. I walked out and took a trolley to my apartment, and Carlo Marx's papier-mâché mountains grew red as the great sun rose from the eastward plains. Chapter 9 In the evening I was involved in that trek to the mountains and didn't see Dean or Carlo for five days. Babe Rollins had the use of her employer's car for the weekend. We brought suits and hung them in the car windows and took off for Central City, Ray Rollins driving, Tim Gray lounging in the back, and Babe up front. It was my first view of the interior of the Rockies. Central City is an old mining town that was once called the richest square mile in the world, where a veritable shelf of silver had been found by the old buzzards who roamed the hills. They grew wealthy overnight and had a beautiful little opera house built in the midst of their shacks on the steep slope. Lillian Russell had come there, and opera stars from Europe. Then Central City became a ghost town, till the energetic Chamber of Commerce types of the New West decided to revive the place. They polished up the opera house, and every summer stars from the Metropolitan came out and performed. It was a big vacation for everybody. Tourists came from everywhere, even Hollywood stars. We drove up the mountain and found the narrow streets chock full of shishi tourists. I thought of Major's Sam, and Major was right. Major himself was there, turning on his big social smile to everybody and ooing and eyeing most sincerely over everything. Sal, he cried, clutching my arm, just look at this old town. Think how it was a hundred, what the hell, only eighty, sixty years ago. They had opera. Yeah, I said, imitating one of his characters. But they're here. The bastards, he cursed. But he went off to enjoy himself, Betty Gray on his arm. Babe Rollins was an enterprising blonde. She knew of an old miner's house at the edge of town where we boys could sleep for the weekend. All we had to do was clean it out. We could also throw vast parties there. It was an old shack of a thing covered with an inch of dust inside. It had a porch and a well in back. Tim Gray and Ray Rollins rolled up their sleeves and started in cleaning it, a major job that took them all afternoon and part of the night. But they had a bucket of beer bottles and everything was fine. As for me, I was scheduled to be a guest at the opera that afternoon, escorting Babe on my arm. I wore a suit of Tim's. Only a few days ago I'd come into Denver like a bum. Now I was all racked up sharp in a suit, with a beautiful well-dressed blonde on my arm, bowing to dignitaries and chatting in the lobby under chandeliers. I wondered what Mississippi Jean would say if he could see me. The opera was Fidelio. What gloom, cried the baritone, rising out of the dungeon under a groaning stone. I cried for it. That's how I see life, too. 
I was so interested in the opera that for a while I forgot the circumstances of my crazy life and got lost in the great mournful sounds of Beethoven and the rich Rembrandt tones of his story. "'Well, Sal, how do you like the production for this year?' asked Denver D. Dahl proudly in the street outside. He was connected with the Opera Association. "'What gloom, what gloom,' I said. "'Absolutely great.' The next thing you'll have to do is meet the members of the cast, he went on in his official tones, but luckily he forgot this in the rush of other things and vanished. Babe and I went back to the miner's shack. I took off my duds and joined the boys in the cleaning. It was an enormous job. Roland Major sat in the middle of the front room that had already been cleaned and refused to help. On a little table in front of him he had his bottle of beer and his glass. As we rushed around with buckets of water and brooms he reminisced. Ah, if you could just come with me some time and drink Cinzano and hear the musicians of Bandol, then you'd be living. Then there's Normandy in the summers, the Sabots, the fine old Calvados. Come on, Sam, he said to his invisible pal. Take the wine out of the water and let's see if it got cold enough while we fished. Straight out of Hemingway it was. We called out to girls who went by in the street. Come on, help us clean up the joint. Everybody's invited to our party tonight. They joined us. We had a huge crew working for us. Finally, the singers in the opera chorus, mostly young kids, came over and pitched in. The sun went down. Our day's work over, Tim, Rollins, and I decided to sharp up for the big night. We went across town to the rooming house where the opera stars were living. Across the night, we heard the beginning of the evening performance. Just right, said Rollins. Latch on to some of these razors and towels and we'll spruce up a bit. We also took hairbrushes, colognes, shaving lotions, and went laden into the bathroom. We all took baths and sang. Isn't this great, Tim Gray kept saying, using the opera star's bathroom and towels and shaving lotion and electric razors. It was a wonderful night. Central City is two miles high. At first you get drunk on the altitude, then you get tired, and there's a fever in your soul. We approached the lights around the opera house down the narrow dark street. Then we took a sharp right and hit some old saloons with swinging doors. Most of the tourists were in the opera. We started off with a few extra-sized beers. There was a player piano. Beyond the back door was a view of mountainsides in the moonlight. I let out a yahoo. The night was on. We hurried back to our miner's shack. Everything was in preparation for the big party. The girls, Babe and Betty, cooked up a snack of beans and franks, and then we danced and started on the beer for fair. The opera was over. Great crowds of young girls came piling into our place. Rollins and Tim and I licked our lips. We grabbed them and danced. There was no music, just dancing. The place filled up. People began to bring bottles. We rushed out to hit the bars and rushed back. The night was getting more and more frantic. I wished Dean and Carlo were there, then I realized they'd be out of place and unhappy. They were like the man with the dungeon stone in the gloom rising from the underground, the sordid hipsters of America, a new beat generation that I was slowly joining. The boys from the chorus showed up. They began singing Sweet Adeline. They also sang phrases such as, Pass me the beer, and What are you doing with your face hanging out? and great long baritone howls of Fidelio. Ah, me, what gloom, I sang. The girls were terrific. They went out in the backyard and necked with us. There were beds in the other rooms, the unclean, dusty ones, and I had a girl sitting on one and was talking with her when suddenly there was a great inrush of young ushers from the opera who just grabbed girls and kissed them without proper come-ons. Teenagers, drunk, disheveled, excited, they ruined our party. Inside of five minutes, every single girl was gone and a great big fraternity-type party got underway with banging of beer bottles and roars. Ray and Tim and I decided to hit the bars. Major was gone. Babe and Betty were gone. We tottered into the night. The opera crowd was jamming the bars from bar to wall. Major was shouting above heads. The eager, bespectacled Denver D. Dahl was shaking hands with everybody and saying, Good afternoon, how are you? And when midnight came, he was saying, Good afternoon, how are you? At one point, I saw him going off somewhere with a dignitary. Then he came back with a middle-aged woman. Next minute, he was talking to a couple of young ushers in the street. The next minute, he was shaking my hand without recognizing me and saying, Happy New Year, my boy. He wasn't drunk on liquor, just drunk on what he liked, crowds of people milling. Everybody knew him. Happy New Year, he called, and sometimes, Merry Christmas. He said this all the time. At Christmas, he said, Happy Halloween. There was a tenor in the bar who was highly respected by everyone. Denver Dahl had insisted that I meet him, and I was trying to avoid it. His name was Danunzio, or some such thing. His wife was with him. They sat sourly at a table. There was also some kind of Argentinian tourist at the bar. Rollins gave him a shove to make room. He turned and snarled.
Rollins handed me his glass and knocked him down on the brass rail with one punch. The man was momentarily out. There were screams. Tim and I scooted Rollins out. There was so much confusion the sheriff couldn't even thread his way through the crowd to find the victim. Nobody could identify Rollins. We went to other bars. Major staggered up a dark street. What the hell's the matter? Any fights? Just call on me. Great laughter rang from all sides. I wondered what the spirit of the mountain was thinking, and looked up and saw jack pines in the moon and saw ghosts of old miners and wondered about it. In the whole eastern dark wall of the divide this night there was silence and the whisper of the wind, except in the ravine where we roared. And on the other side of the divide was the great western slope and the big plateau that went to Steamboat Springs and dropped and led you to the western Colorado desert and the Utah desert. All in darkness now as we fumed and screamed in our midnight nook, mad drunken Americans in the mighty land. We were on the roof of America, and all we could do was yell, I guess, across the night, eastward over the plains, where somewhere an old man with white hair was probably walking toward us with the word, and would arrive any minute and make us silent. Rollins insisted on going back to the bar where he'd fought. Tim and I didn't like it, but stuck to him. He went up to Denunzio, the tenor, and threw a highball in his face. We dragged him out. A baritone singer from the chorus joined us, and we went to a regular Central City bar. Here, Ray called the waitress a whore. A group of sullen men were ranged along the bar. They hated tourists. One of them said, You boys better be out of here by the count of ten. We were. We staggered back to the shack and went to sleep. In the morning I woke up and turned over. A big cloud of dust rose from the mattress. I yanked at the window. It was nailed. Tim Gray was in the bed, too. We coughed and sneezed. Our breakfast consisted of stale beer. Babe came back from her hotel, and we got our things together to leave. Everything seemed to be collapsing. As we were going out to the car, Babe slipped and fell flat on her face. Poor girl was overwrought. Her brother and Tim and I helped her up. We got in the car. Major and Betty joined us. The sad ride back to Denver began. Suddenly we came down from the mountain and overlooked the great seaplane of Denver. Heat rose as from an oven. We began to sing songs. I was itching to get on to San Francisco. Chapter 10 That night I found Carlo, and to my amazement he told me he'd been in Central City with Dean. What did you do? Oh, we ran around the bars, and then Dean stole a car, and we drove back down the mountain curves ninety miles an hour. I didn't see you. We didn't know you were there. Well, man, I'm going to San Francisco. Dean has Rita lined up for you tonight. Well, then I'll put it off. I had no money. I sent my aunt an airmail letter asking her for fifty dollars and said it would be the last money I'd ask. After that, she would be getting money back from me, as soon as I got that ship. Then I went to meet Rita Betancourt and took her back to the apartment. I got her in my bedroom after a long talk in the dark of the front room. She was a nice little girl, simple and true, and tremendously frightened of sex. I told her it was beautiful. I wanted to prove this to her. She let me prove it, but I was too impatient and proved nothing. She sighed in the dark. What do you want out of life? I asked. And I used to ask that all the time of girls. I don't know, she said. Just wait on tables and try to get along. She yawned. I put my hand over her mouth and told her not to yawn. I tried to tell her how excited I was about life and the things we could do together. Saying that and planning to leave Denver in two days, she turned away wearily. We lay on our backs, looking at the ceiling and wondering what God had wrought when he made life so sad. We made vague plans to meet in Frisco. My moments in Denver were coming to an end. I could feel it when I walked her home. On the way back, I stretched out on the grass of an old church with a bunch of hobos, and their talk made me want to get back on that road. Every now and then, one would get up and hit a passerby for a dime. They talked of harvests moving north. It was warm and soft. I wanted to go and get Rita again and tell her a lot more things and really make love to her this time and calm her fears about men. Boys and girls in America have such a sad time together. Sophistication demands that they submit to sex immediately without proper preliminary talk. Not courting talk, real straight talk about souls, for life is holy and every moment is precious. I heard the Denver and Rio Grande locomotive howling off to the mountains. I wanted to pursue my star further. Major and I sat sadly talking in the midnight hours. Have you ever read Green Hills of Africa? It's Hemingway's best. We wished each other luck. We would meet in Frisco. I saw Rollins under a dark tree in the street. Goodbye, Ray. When do we meet again? I went to look for Carlo and Dean, nowhere to be found. Tim Gray shot his hand up in the air and said, So you're leaving, yo? We called each other, yo. Yep, I said. 
The next few days I wandered around Denver. It seemed to me every bum on Larimer Street maybe was Dean Moriarty's father. Old Dean Moriarty, they called him, the tinsmith. I went in the Windsor Hotel where father and son had lived and where one night Dean was frightfully waked up by the legless man on the rollerboard who shared the room with them. He came thundering across the floor on his terrible wheels to touch the boy. I saw the little midget newspaper-selling woman with the short legs on the corner of Curtis and 15th. I walked around the sad honky-tonks of Curtis Street, young kids in jeans and red shirts, peanut shells, movie marquees, shooting parlors. Beyond the glittering street was darkness, and beyond the darkness the west. I had to go. At dawn I found Carlo. I read some of his enormous journal, slept there, and in the morning, drizzly and gray, tall six-foot Ed Dunkel came in with Roy Johnson, a handsome kid, and Tom Snark, the club-footed pool shark. They sat around and listened with abashed smiles as Carlo Marx read them his apocalyptic mad poetry. I slumped in my chair, finished. "'Oh, ye Denver birds!' cried Carlo. We all filed out and went up a typical cobbled Denver alley between incinerators, smoking slowly. "'I used to roll my hoop up this alley,' Chad King had told me. I wanted to see him do it. I wanted to see Denver ten years ago when they were all children— and in the sunny cherry-blossom morning of springtime in the Rockies, rolling their hoops up the joyous alleys full of promise, the whole gang, and Dean, ragged and dirty, prowling by himself in his preoccupied frenzy. Roy Johnson and I walked in the drizzle. I went to Eddie's girl's house to get back my wool plaid shirt, the shirt of Shelton, Nebraska. It was there, all tied up, the whole enormous sadness of a shirt. Roy Johnson said he'd meet me in Frisco. Everybody was going to Frisco. I went and found my money had arrived. The sun came out, and Tim Gray rode a trolley with me to the bus station. I bought my ticket to San Fran, spending half of the fifty, and got on at two o'clock in the afternoon. Tim Gray waved goodbye. The bus rolled out of the storied, eager Denver streets. By God, I gotta come back and see what else'll happen, I promised. In a last-minute phone call, Dean said he and Carlo might join me on the coast. I pondered this and realized I hadn't talked to Dean for more than five minutes in the whole time. Chapter 11 I was two weeks late meeting Remy Boncoeur. The bus trip from Denver to Frisco was uneventful, except that my whole soul leaped to it the nearer we got to Frisco. Cheyenne again in the afternoon this time, and then west over the range, crossing the divide at midnight at Creston, arriving at Salt Lake City at dawn, a city of sprinklers, the least likely place for Dean to have been born. Then out to Nevada in the hot sun, Reno by nightfall, its twinkling Chinese streets— then up the Sierra Nevada, pines, stars, mountain lodges signifying Frisco romances, a little girl in the back seat crying to her mother, Mama, when do we get home to Truckee? And Truckee itself, homey Truckee, and then down the hill to the flats of Sacramento. I suddenly realized I was in California. Warm, palmy air, air you can kiss, and palms. Along the storied Sacramento River on a superhighway, into the hills again, up, down, and suddenly the vast expanse of bay— it was just before dawn, with the sleepy lights of Frisco festooned across. Over the Oakland Bay Bridge I slept soundly for the first time since Denver, so that I was rudely jolted in the bus station at Market and Forth into the memory of the fact that I was 3,200 miles from my aunt's house in Patterson, New Jersey. I wandered out like a haggard ghost, and there she was, Frisco, long, bleak streets with trolley wires all shrouded in fog and whiteness. I stumbled around a few blocks. Weird bums, Mission and Third, asked me for dimes in the dawn. I heard music somewhere. Boy, am I going to dig all this later, but now I've got to find Remy Boncoeur. Mill City, where Remy lived, was a collection of shacks in a valley, housing project shacks built for Navy yard workers during the war. It was in a canyon and a deep one, treed profusely on all slopes. There were special stores and barber shops and tailor shops for the people of the project. It was, so they say, the only community in America where whites and Negroes lived together voluntarily, and that was so, and so wild and joyous a place I've never seen since. On the door of Remy's shack was the note he had pinned up there three weeks ago. Sal Paradise, in huge letters printed. If nobody's home, climb in through the window. Signed, Remy Boncoeur. The note was weather-beaten and gray by now. I climbed in, and there he was, sleeping with his girl, Leanne, on a bed he stole from a merchant ship, as he told me later. Imagine the deck engineer of a merchant ship sneaking over the side in the middle of the night with a bed and heaving and straining at the oars to shore. This barely explains Remy Boncoeur. The reason I'm going into everything that happened in San Fran is because it ties up with everything else all the way down the line. Remy Boncoeur and I met at prep school years ago, but the thing that really linked us together was my former wife. Remy found her first. 
He came into my dorm room one night and said, Paradise, get up. The old maestro has come to see you. I got up and dropped some pennies on the floor when I put my pants on. It was four in the afternoon. I used to sleep all the time in college. All right, all right, don't drop your gold all over the place. I have found the gonest little girl in the world, and I'm going straight to the lion's den with her tonight. And he dragged me to meet her. A week later, she was going with me. Remy was a tall, dark, handsome Frenchman. He looked like a kind of Marseille black marketeer of twenty. Because he was French, he had to talk in jazz American. His English was perfect, his French was perfect. He liked to dress sharp, slightly on the collegiate side, and go out with fancy blondes and spend a lot of money. It's not that he ever blamed me for taking off with his girl. It was only a point that always tied us together. That guy was loyal to me and had real affection for me, and God knows why. When I found him in Mill City that morning, he had fallen on the beat and evil days that come to young guys in their middle twenties. He was hanging around waiting for a ship, and to earn his living he had a job as a special guard in the barracks across the canyon. His girl, Leanne, had a bad tongue and gave him a call down every day. They spent all week saving pennies and went out Saturdays to spend fifty bucks in three hours. Remy wore shorts around the shack with a crazy army cap on his head. Leanne went around with her hair up in pin curls. Thus attired, they yelled at each other all week. I never saw so many snarls in all my born days. But on Saturday night, smiling graciously at each other, they took off like a pair of successful Hollywood characters and went on the town. Remy woke up and saw me come in the window. His great laugh, one of the greatest laughs in the world, dinned in my ear. Ah, paradise, he comes in through the window. He follows instructions to a T. Where have you been? You're two weeks late. He slapped me on the back. He punched Leanne in the ribs. He leaned on the wall and laughed and cried. He pounded on the table so you could hear it everywhere in Mill City. And that great long, ah, resounded around the canyon. Paradise, he screamed. The one and only indispensable paradise. i just come through the little fishing village of Sausalito, and the first thing I said was, there must be a lot of Italians in Sausalito. There must be a lot of Italians in Sausalito, he shouted at the top of his lungs. Ah! He pounded himself. He fell on the bed. He almost rolled on the floor. Did you hear what Paradise said? There must be a lot of Italians in Sausalito. Ah, ha, who, wow, we. He got red as a beet, laughing. Oh, you slay me, Paradise. You're the funniest man in the world, and here you are. You finally got here. He came in through the window. You saw him, Leanne. He followed instructions and came in through the window. Ah, who. The strange thing was that next door to Remy lived a negro called Mr. Snow, whose laugh, I swear on the Bible, was positively and finally the one greatest laugh in all this world. This Mr. Snow began his laugh from the supper table when his old wife said something casual. He got up, apparently choking, leaned on the wall, looked up to heaven, and started. He staggered through the door, leaning on neighbors' walls. He was drunk with it. He reeled throughout Mill City in the shadows, raising his whooping, triumphant call to the demon god that must have prodded him to do it. I don't know if he ever finished supper. There's a possibility that Remy, without knowing it, was picking up from this amazing man, Mr. Snow. And though Remy was having work-life problems and bad love life with a sharp-tongued woman, he at least had learned to laugh almost better than anyone in the world. And I saw all the fun we were going to have in Frisco. The pitch was this. Remy slept with Leanne in the bed across the room, and I slept in the cot by the window. I was not to touch Leanne. Remy at once made a speech concerning this. I don't want to find you two playing around when you think I'm not looking. You can't teach the old maestro a new tune. This is an original saying of mine. I looked at Leanne. She was a fetching hunk, a honey-colored creature, but there was hate in her eyes for both of us. Her ambition was to marry a rich man. She came from a small town in Oregon. She rued the day she ever took up with Remy. On one of his big show-off weekends, he spent a hundred dollars on her, and she thought she'd found an heir. Instead, she was hung up in this shack, and for lack of anything else, she had to stay there. She had a job in Frisco. She had to take the Greyhound bus at the crossroads and go in every day. She never forgave Remy for it. I was to stay in the shack and write a shining original story for a Hollywood studio. Remy was going to fly down in a stratosphere liner with this harp under his arm and make us all rich. Leanne was to go with him. He was going to introduce her to his buddy's father, who was a famous director and an intimate of W.C. Fields. So the first week I stayed in the shack in Mill City, writing furiously at some gloomy tale about New York that I thought would satisfy a Hollywood director, and the trouble with it was that it was too sad. Remy could barely read it, and so he just carried it down to Hollywood a few weeks later. 
Leanne was too bored and hated us too much to bother reading it. I spent countless rainy hours drinking coffee and scribbling. Finally, I told Remy it wouldn't do. I wanted a job. I had to depend on them for cigarettes. A shadow of disappointment crossed Remy's brow. He was always being disappointed about the funniest things. He had a heart of gold. He arranged to get me the same kind of job he had as a guard in the barracks. I went through the necessary routine, and to my surprise, the bastards hired me. I was sworn in by the local police chief, given a badge, a club, and now I was a special policeman. I wondered what Dean and Carlo and old Bull Lee would say about this. I had to have navy blue trousers to go with my black jacket and cop cap. For the first two weeks, I had to wear Remy's trousers. Since he was so tall and had a pot belly from eating voracious meals out of boredom, I went flapping around like Charlie Chaplin to my first night of work. Remy gave me a flashlight and his thirty-two automatic. Where'd you get this gun? I asked. On my way to the coast last summer, I jumped off the train at North Platte, Nebraska to stretch my legs, and what did I see in the window but this unique little gun which I promptly bought and barely made the train. And I tried to tell him what North Platte meant to me, buying the whiskey with the boys, and he slapped me on the back and said I was the funniest man in the world. With the flashlight to illuminate my way, I climbed the steep walls of the South Canyon, got up on the highway streaming with cars, Frisco-bound in the night, scrambled down the other side, almost falling, and came to the bottom of a ravine where a little farmhouse stood near a creek and where every blessed night the same dog barked at me. Then it was a fast walk along a silvery, dusty road beneath inky trees of California, a road like the Mark of Zorro, and a road like all the roads you see in Western B-movies. I used to take out my gun and play cowboys in the dark. Then I climbed another hill, and there were the barracks. These barracks were for the temporary quartering of overseas construction workers. The men who came through stayed there, waiting for their ship. Most of them were bound for Okinawa. Most of them were running away from something, usually the law. There were tough groups from Alabama, shifty men from New York, all kinds from all over. And, knowing full well how horrible it would be to work a full year in Okinawa, they drank. The job of the special guards was to see that they didn't tear the barracks down. We had our headquarters in the main building, just a wooden contraption with panel-walled offices. Here at a roll-top desk we sat around, shifting our guns off our hips and yawning, and the old cops told stories. It was a horrible crew of men, men with cop souls, all except Remy and myself. Remy was only trying to make a living, and so was I, but these men wanted to make arrests and get compliments from the chief of police in town. They even said that if you didn't make at least one a month, you'd be fired. I gulped at the prospect of making an arrest. What actually happened was that I was as drunk as anybody in the barracks the night all hell broke loose. This was a night when the schedule was so arranged that I was all alone for six hours, the only cop on the grounds, and everybody in the barracks seemed to have gotten drunk that night. It was because their ship was leaving in the morning. They drank like seamen the night before the anchor goes up. I sat in the office with my feet on the desk, reading blue book adventures about Oregon and the North Country, when suddenly I realized there was a great hum of activity in the usually quiet night. I went out. Lights were burning in practically every damned shack on the grounds. Men were shouting, bottles were breaking. It was do or die for me. I took my flashlight and went to the noisiest door and knocked. Someone opened it about six inches. What do you want? I said, I'm guarding these barracks tonight, and you boys are supposed to keep quiet as much as you can or some such silly remark. They slammed the door in my face. I stood looking at the wood of it against my nose. It was like a Western movie. The time had come for me to assert myself. I knocked again. They opened up wide this time. Listen, I said, I don't want to come around bothering you fellas, but I'll lose my job if you make too much noise. Who are you? I'm a guard here. Never seen you before. Well, here's my badge. What are you doing with that pistol cracker on your ass? It isn't mine, I apologized. I borrowed it. Have a drink, for Christ's sakes. I didn't mind if I did. I took two. I said, okay, boys, you'll keep quiet, boys. I'll get hell, you know. It's all right, kid, they said. Go make your rounds. Come back for another drink if you want one. And I went to all the doors in this manner, and pretty soon I was as drunk as anybody else. Come dawn, it was my duty to put up the American flag on a sixty-foot pole, and this morning I put it up upside down and went home to bed. When I came back in the evening, the regular cops were sitting around grimly in the office. Say, Bo, what was all the noise around here last night? We've had complaints from people who live in those houses across the canyon. I don't know, I said. It sounds pretty quiet right now. The whole contingent's gone. You were supposed to keep order around here last night. The chief is yelling at you. And another thing. 
Do you know you can go to jail for putting the American flag upside down on a government pole? Upside down? I was horrified. Of course I hadn't realized it. I did it every morning mechanically. Yes, sir, said a fat cop who'd spent twenty-two years as a guard in Alcatraz. You could go to jail for doing something like that. The others nodded grimly. They were always sitting around on their asses. They were proud of their jobs. They handled their guns and talked about them. They were itching to shoot somebody. Remy and me. The cop who had been an Alcatraz guard was pot-bellied and about sixty, retired but unable to keep away from the atmospheres that had nourished his dry soul all his life. Every night he drove to work in his thirty-five Ford, punched the clock exactly on time, and sat down at the roll-top desk. He labored painfully over the simple form we all had to fill out every night, rounds, time, what happened, and so on. Then he leaned back and told stories. You should have been here about two months ago when me and Sledge, that was another cop, a youngster who wanted to be a Texas Ranger and had to be satisfied with his present lot, arrested a drunk in Barrack G. Boy, you should have seen the blood fly. I'll take you over there tonight and show you the stains on the wall. We had him bouncing from one wall to another. First Sledge hit him, then me, and then he subsided and went quietly. That fella swore to kill us when he got out of jail, got thirty days. Here it is sixty days, and he ain't showed up. And this was the big point of the story. They'd put such a fear in him that he was too yellow to come back and try to kill them. The old cop went on, sweetly reminiscing about the horrors of Alcatraz. We used to march him like an army platoon to breakfast. Wasn't one man out of step. Everything went like clockwork. You should have seen it. I was a guard there for twenty-two years, never had any trouble. Those boys knew we meant business. A lot of fellows get soft guarding prisoners, and they're the ones that usually get in trouble. Now you take you. From what I've been observing about you, you seem to me a little bit too lenient with the men. He raised his pipe and looked at me sharp. They take advantage of that, you know. I knew that. I told him I wasn't cut out to be a cop. Yes, but that's the job you applied for. Now you got to make up your mind one way or the other, or you'll never get anywhere. It's your duty. You're sworn in. You can't compromise with things like this. Law and order's got to be kept. I didn't know what to say. He was right. But all I wanted to do was sneak out into the night and disappear somewhere and go and find out what everybody was doing all over the country. The other cop, Sledge, was tall, muscular, with a black-haired crew cut and a nervous twitch in his neck, like a boxer who's always punching one fist into another. He rigged himself out like a Texas Ranger of old. He wore a revolver down low with ammunition belt and carried a small quirt of some kind, and pieces of leather hanging everywhere like a walking torture chamber. Shiny shoes, low-hanging jacket, cocky hat, everything but boots. He was always showing me holds, reaching down under my crotch and lifting me up nimbly. In point of strength, I could have thrown him clear to the ceiling with the same hold, and I knew it well, but I never let him know for fear he'd want a wrestling match. A wrestling match with a guy like that would end up in shooting. I'm sure he was a better shot. I'd never had a gun in my life. It scared me even to load one. He desperately wanted to make arrests. One night we were alone on duty and he came back red-faced mad. I told some boys in there to keep quiet and they're still making noise. I told them twice. I always give a man two chances, not three. You come with me and I'm going back there and arrest them. Well, let me give them a third chance. I said I'll talk to them. No, sir, I never gave a man more than two chances. I sighed. Here we go. We went to the offending room and Sledge opened the door and told everybody to file out. It was embarrassing. Every single one of us was blushing. This is the story of America. Everybody's doing what they think they're supposed to do. So what if a bunch of men talk in loud voices and drink the night? But Sledge wanted to prove something. He made sure to bring me along in case they jumped him. They might have. They were all brothers, all from Alabama. We strolled back to the station, Sledge in front and me in back. One of the boys said to me, Tell that crotch-eared mean ass to take it easy on us. We might get fired for this never get to Okinawa. I'll talk to him. In the station, I told Sledge to forget it. He said for everybody to hear, and blushing, I don't give anybody no more than two chances. What the hell, said the Alabaman. What difference does it make? We might lose our jobs. Sledge said nothing and filled out the arrest forms. He arrested only one of them. He called the prowl car in town. They came and took him away. The other brothers walked off sullenly. What's Ma gonna say, they said. One of them came back to me. You tell that Texas son of a bitch if my brother ain't out of jail tomorrow night, he's gonna get his ass fixed. 
I told Sledge in a neutral way, and he said nothing. The brother was let off easy and nothing happened. The contention shipped out. A new wild bunch came in. If it hadn't been for Remy Boncur, I wouldn't have stayed at this job two hours. But Remy Boncur and I were on duty alone many a night, and that's when everything jumped. We made our first round of the evening in a leisurely way, Remy trying all the doors to see if they were locked and hoping to find one unlocked. He'd say, For years I've an idea to develop a dog into a super thief, who'd go into these guys' rooms and take dollars out of their pockets. I'd train him to take nothing but green money. I'd make him smell it all day long. If there was any humanly possible way, I'd train him only to take twenties. Remy was full of mad schemes. He talked about that dog for weeks. Only once he found an unlocked door. I didn't like the idea, so I sauntered on down the hall. Remy stealthily opened it up. He came face to face with the barracks supervisor. Remy hated that man's face. He asked me, What's the name of that Russian author you're always talking about? The one who put the newspapers in his shoe and walked around in a stovepipe hat he found in a garbage pail? This was an exaggeration of what I'd told Remy of Dostoevsky. Ah, that's it. That's it. Dostoevsky. A man with a face like that supervisor can only have one name. It's Dostoevsky. The only unlocked door he ever found belonged to Dostoevsky. D was asleep when he heard someone fiddling with his doorknob. He got up in his pajamas. He came to the door looking twice as ugly as usual. When Remy opened it, he saw a haggard face suppurated with hatred and dull fury. What is the meaning of this? I was only trying this door. I thought this was the, uh, mop room. I was looking for a mop. What do you mean you were looking for a mop? Well, uh... And I stepped up and said, One of the men puked in the hall upstairs. We have to mop it up. This is not the mop room. This is my room. Another incident like this, and I'll have you fellas investigated and thrown out. You understand me clearly? A fella puked upstairs, I said again. The mop room is down the hall. Down there. And he pointed and waited for us to go and get a mop, which we did, and foolishly carried it upstairs. I said, God damn it, Remy, you're always getting us into trouble. Why don't you lay off? Why do you have to steal all the time? The world owes me a few things, that's all. You can't teach the old maestro a new tune. You go on talking like that and I'm going to start calling you Dostoevsky. Remy was just like a little boy. Somewhere in his past, in his lonely school days in France, they'd taken everything from him. His step-parents just stuck him in schools and left him there. He was browbeaten and thrown out of one school after another. He walked the French roads at night, devising curses out of his innocent stock of words. He was out to get back everything he'd lost. There was no end to his loss. This thing would drag on forever. The barracks cafeteria was our meat. We looked around to make sure nobody was watching, and especially to see if any of our cop friends were lurking about to check on us. Then I squatted down, and Remy put a foot on each shoulder, and up he went. He opened the window, which was never locked since he saw to it in the evenings, scrambled through, and came down on the flower table. I was a little more agile and just jumped and crawled in. Then we went to the soda fountain. Here, realizing a dream of mine from infancy, I took the cover off the chocolate ice cream and stuck my hand in wrist deep and hauled me up a skewer of ice cream and licked at it. Then we got ice cream boxes and stuffed them, pouring chocolate syrup over and sometimes strawberries too, then walked around in the kitchens, opened ice boxes to see what we could take home in our pockets. I often tore off a piece of roast beef and wrapped it in a napkin. You know what President Truman said, Remy would say. We must cut down on the cost of living. One night I waited a long time as he filled a huge box full of groceries. Then we couldn't get it through the window. Remy had to unpack everything and put it back. Later in the night, when he went off duty and I was all alone on the base, a strange thing happened. I was taking a walk along the old canyon trail, hoping to meet a deer. Remy had seen deer around, that country being wild even in 1947, when I heard a frightening noise in the dark. It was a huffing and puffing. I thought it was a rhinoceros coming for me in the dark. I grabbed my gun. A tall figure appeared in the canyon gloom. It had an enormous head. Suddenly I realized it was Remy with a huge box of groceries on his shoulder. He was moaning and groaning from the enormous weight of it. He'd found the key to the cafeteria somewhere and had got his groceries out the front door. I said, Remy, I thought you were home. What the hell are you doing? And he said, Paradise, I have told you several times what President Truman said. We must cut down on the cost of living. And I heard him huff and puff into the darkness. I've already described that awful trail back to our shack, uphill and down dale. 
He hid the groceries in the tall grass and came back to me. Sal, I just can't make it alone. I'm going to divide it into two boxes and you're going to help me. But I'm on duty. I'll watch the place while you're gone. Things are getting rough all around. We've just got to make it the best way we can, and that's all there is to it. He wiped his face. Whew. I've told you time and time again, Sal, that we're buddies, and we're in this thing together. There's just no two ways about it. The Dostoevskys, the cops, the Leans, all the evil skulls of this world are out for our skin. It's up to us to see that nobody pulls any schemes on us. They've got a lot more up their sleeves besides a dirty arm. Remember that. You can't teach the old maestro a new tune. I finally asked, whatever are we going to do about shipping out? We'd been doing these things for ten weeks. I was making fifty-five bucks a week and sending my aunt an average of forty. I'd spent only one evening in San Francisco in all that time. My life was wrapped in the shack, in Remy's battles with Leanne, and in the middle of the night at the barracks. Remy was gone off in the dark to get another box. I struggled with him on that old Zorro road. We piled up the groceries a mile high on Leanne's kitchen table. She woke up and rubbed her eyes. You know what President Truman said? She was delighted. I suddenly began to realize that everybody in America is a natural-born thief. I was getting the bug myself. I even began to try to see if doors were locked. The other cops were getting suspicious of us. They saw it in our eyes. They understood with unfailing instinct what was on our minds. Years of experience had taught them the likes of Remy and me. In the daytime, Remy and I went out with a gun and tried to shoot quail in the hills. Remy sneaked up to within three feet of the clucking birds and let go a blast of the thirty-two. He missed. His tremendous laugh roared over the California woods and over America. The time has come for you and me to go and see the Banana King. It was Saturday. We got all spruced up and went down to the bus station on the crossroads. We rode into San Francisco and strolled through the streets. Remy's huge laugh resounded everywhere we went. You must write a story about the Banana King, he warned me. Don't pull any tricks on the old maestro and write about something else. The Banana King is your meat. There stands the Banana King. The Banana King was an old man selling bananas on the corner. I was completely bored. But Remy kept punching me in the ribs and even dragging me along by the collar. When you write about the Banana King, you write about the human interest things of life. I told him I didn't give a damn about the Banana King. Until you learn to realize the importance of the Banana King, you will know absolutely nothing about the human interest things of the world, said Remy emphatically. There was an old rusty freighter out in the bay that was used as a buoy. Remy was all for rowing out to it, so one afternoon Leanne packed a lunch and we hired a boat and went out there. Remy brought some tools. Leanne took all her clothes off and lay down to sun herself on the flying bridge. I watched her from the poop. Remy went clear down to the boiler rooms below where rats scurried around and began hammering and banging away for copper lining that wasn't there. I sat in the dilapidated officer's mess. It was an old, old ship and had been beautifully appointed with scroll work in the wood and built-in sea chests. This was the ghost of the San Francisco of Jack London. I dreamed at the sunny mess board. Rats ran in the pantry. Once upon a time there'd been a blue-eyed sea captain dining in here. I joined Remy in the bowels below. He yanked at everything loose. Not a thing. I thought there'd be copper. I thought there'd be at least an old wrench or two. This ship's been stripped by a bunch of thieves. It had been standing in the bay for years. The copper had been stolen by a hand that was a hand no more. I said to Remy, I'd love to sleep in this old ship some night when the fog comes in and the thing creaks and you hear the big B.O. of the buoys. Remy was astounded. His admiration for me doubled. Sal, I'll pay you five dollars if you have the nerve to do that. Don't you realize this thing may be haunted by the ghosts of old sea captains? I'll not only pay you five, I'll roll you out and pack you a lunch and lend you blankets and candle. Agreed, I said. Remy ran to tell Leanne. I wanted to jump down from a mast and land right on her, but I kept my promise to Remy. I averted my eyes from her. Meanwhile, I began going to Frisco more often. I tried everything in the books to make a girl. I even spent a whole night with a girl on a park bench till dawn without success. She was a blonde from Minnesota. There were plenty of queers. Several times I went to San Fran with my gun, and when a queer approached me in a bar, John, I took out the gun and said, Eh? Eh? What's that you say? He bolted. I've never understood why I did that. I knew queers all over the country. It was just the loneliness of San Francisco and the fact that I had a gun. I had to show it to someone. 
I walked by a jewelry store and had the sudden impulse to shoot up the window, take out the finest rings and bracelets, and run to give them to Lee Ann. Then we could flee to Nevada together. The time was coming for me to leave Frisco or I'd go crazy. I wrote long letters to Dean and Carlo, who were now at Old Bull's shack in the Texas Bayou. They said they were ready to come join me in San Fran as soon as this gnat was ready. Meanwhile, everything began to collapse with Remy and Leanne and me. The September rains came, and with them harangues. Remy had flown down to Hollywood with her, taking my sad, silly movie original, and nothing had happened. The famous director was drunk and paid no attention to them. They hung around his Malibu beach cottage. They started fighting in front of other guests. They flew back. The final topper was the racetrack. Remy saved all his money, about a hundred dollars, spruced me up in some of his clothes, put Leanne on his arm, and off we went to Golden Gate Racetrack near Richmond across the bay. To show you what a heart that guy had, he put half of our stolen groceries in a tremendous brown paper bag and then took them to a poor widow he knew in Richmond at a housing project, much like our own, wash flapping in the California sun. We went with him. There were sad, ragged children. The woman thanked Remy. She was the sister of some seaman he vaguely knew. "'Think nothing of it, Mrs. Carter,' said Remy in his most elegant and polite tones. "'There's plenty more where that came from.' We proceeded to the racetrack. He made incredible twenty-dollar bets to win, and before the seventh race he was broke. With our last two food dollars he placed still another bet and lost. We had to hitchhike back to San Francisco. I was on the road again. A gentleman gave us a ride in his snazzy car. I sat up front with him. Remy was trying to put a story down that he'd lost his wallet in back of the grandstand at the track. The truth is, I said, we lost all our money on the races, and to forestall any more hitching from racetracks, from now on we go to a bookie, eh, Remy? Remy blushed all over. The man finally admitted he was an official of the Golden Gate track. He led us off at the elegant Palace Hotel. We watched him disappear among the chandeliers, his pockets full of money, his head held high. Wow, ooh, howled Remy in the evening trees of Frisco. Paradise rides with the man who runs the racetrack and swears he's switching to bookies. Leanne, Leanne! He punched and mauled her. Positively the funniest man in the world. There must be a lot of Italians in Sausalito. Ah, how! He wrapped himself around a pole to laugh. That night it started raining as Leanne gave dirty looks to both of us. Not a cent left in the house. The rain drummed on the roof. It's going to last for a week, said Remy. He had taken off his beautiful suit. He was back in his miserable shorts and army cap and T-shirt. His great brown sad eyes stared at the planks of the floor. The gun lay on the table. We could hear Mr. Snow laughing his head off across the rainy night somewhere. I get so sick and tired of that son of a bitch, snapped Leanne. She was on the go to start trouble. She began needling Remy. He was busy going through his little black book in which were names of people, mostly seamen, who owed him money. Beside their names he wrote curses in red ink. I dreaded the day I'd ever find my way into that book. Lately I'd been sending so much money to my aunt that I only bought four or five dollars worth of groceries a week. In keeping with what President Truman said, I added a few more dollars worth. But Remy felt it wasn't my proper share, so he'd taken to hanging the grocery slips, the long ribbon slips with itemized prices, on the wall of the bathroom for me to see and understand. Leanne was convinced Remy was hiding money from her, and that I was too, for that matter. She threatened to leave him. Remy curled his lip. Where do you think you'll go? Jimmy. Jimmy? A cashier at the racetrack? Do you hear that, Sal? Leanne is going to go and put the latch on a cashier at the racetrack. Be sure and bring your broom, dear. The horses are going to eat a lot of oats this week with my hundred-dollar bill. Things grew to worse proportions. The rain roared. Leanne originally lived in the place first, so she told Remy to pack up and get out. He started packing. I pictured myself all alone in this rainy shack with that untamed shrew. I tried to intervene. Remy pushed Leanne. She made a jump for the gun. Remy gave me the gun and told me to hide it. There was a clip of eight shells in it. Leanne began screaming, and finally she put on her raincoat and went out in the mud to find a cop. And what a cop, if it wasn't our old friend Alcatraz. Luckily he wasn't home. She came back all wet. I hid in my corner with my head between my knees. Gad, what was I doing three thousand miles from home? Why had I come here? Where was my slow boat to China? And another thing, you dirty man, yelled Leanne. Tonight was the last time I'll ever make you your filthy brains and eggs and your filthy lamb curry so you can fill your filthy belly and get fat and sassy right before my eyes. It's all right, Remy just said quietly. It's perfectly all right. 
When I took up with you, I didn't expect roses and moonshine, and I'm not surprised this day. I tried to do a few things for you. I tried my best for both of you. You've both let me down. I'm terribly, terribly disappointed in both of you, he continued in absolute sincerity. I thought something would come of us together, something fine and lasting. I tried. I flew to Hollywood. I got Sally job. I bought you beautiful dresses. I tried to introduce you to the finest people in San Francisco. You refused. You both refused to follow the slightest wish I had. I asked for nothing in return. Now I ask for one last favor, and then I'll never ask a favor again. My stepfather is coming to San Francisco next Saturday night. All I ask is that you come with me and try to look as though everything is the way I've written him. In other words, you, Leanne, you are my girl, and you, Sal, you are my friend. I've arranged to borrow a hundred dollars for Saturday night. I'm going to see that my father has a good time and can go away without any reason in the world to worry about me. This surprised me. Remy's stepfather was a distinguished doctor who had practiced in Vienna, Paris, and London. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to spend a hundred dollars on your stepfather? He's got more money than you'll ever have. You'll be in debt, man. That's all right, said Remy quietly and with defeat in his voice. I ask only one last thing of you, that you try at least to make things look right and try to make a good impression. I love my stepfather and I respect him. He's coming with his young wife. We must show him every courtesy. There were times when Remy was really the most gentlemanly person in the world. Leanne was impressed and looked forward to meeting his stepfather. She thought he might be a catch if his son wasn't. Saturday night rolled around. I'd already quit my job with the cops just before being fired for not making enough arrests, and this was going to be my last Saturday night. Remy and Leanne went to meet his stepfather at the hotel room first. I had traveling money and got crocked in the bar downstairs. Then I went up to join them all, late as hell. His father opened the door, a distinguished tall man in pince-nez. Ah, I said on seeing him, Monsieur Boncoeur, how are you? Je suis au, I cried, which was intended to mean in French, I am high, I have been drinking, but means absolutely nothing in French. The doctor was perplexed. I had already screwed up Remy. He blushed at me. We all went to a swank restaurant to eat, Alfred's in North Beach, where poor Remy spent a good fifty dollars for the five of us, drinks and all. And now came the worst thing. Who should be sitting at the bar in Alfred's but my old friend Roland Major? He had just arrived from Denver and got a job on a San Francisco paper. He was crocked. He wasn't even shaved. He rushed over and slapped me on the back as I lifted a highball to my lips. He threw himself down on the booth beside Dr. Boncoeur and leaned over the man's soup to talk to me. Remy was red as a beet. Won't you introduce your friend, Sal? He said with a weak smile. Roland Major of the San Francisco Argus, I tried to say with a straight face. Leanne was furious at me. Major began chatting in the monsieur's ear. How do you like teaching high school French? He yelled. Pardon me, but I don't teach high school French. Oh, I thought you taught high school French. He was being deliberately rude. I remembered the night he wouldn't let us have our party in Denver, but I forgave him. I forgave everybody. I gave up. I got drunk. I began talking moonshine and roses to the doctor's young wife. I drank so much I had to go to the men's room every two minutes, and to do so I had to hop over Dr. Boncourt's lap. Everything was falling apart. My stay in San Francisco was coming to an end. Remy would never talk to me again. It was horrible because I really loved Remy, and I was one of the very few people in the world who knew what a genuine and grand fellow he was. It would take years for him to get over it. How disastrous all this was compared to what I'd written him from Patterson, planning my red line Route 6 across America. Here I was at the end of America, no more land, and now there was nowhere to go but back. I determined at least to make my trip a circular one. I decided then and there to go see Hollywood and back through Texas to see my Bayou gang. Then the rest be damned. Major was thrown out of Alfred's. Dinner was over anyway, so I joined him. That is to say, Remy suggested it, and I went off with Major to drink. We sat at a table in the iron pot, and Major said, Sam, I don't like that fairy at the bar, in a loud voice. Yeah, Jake, I said. Sam, he said, I think I'll get up and conk him. No, Jake, I said, carrying on with the Hemingway imitation. Just aim from here and see what happens. We ended up swaying on a street corner. In the morning, as Remy and Leanne slept, and as I looked with some sadness at the big pile of wash Remy and I were scheduled to do in the Bendix machine in the shack in the back, which had always been such a joyous, sunny operation among the colored women and with Mr. Snow laughing his head off, I decided to leave. I went out on the porch. No, damn it, I said to myself. I promised I wouldn't leave till I climbed that mountain.
That was the big side of the canyon that led mysteriously to the Pacific Ocean. So I stayed another day. It was Sunday. A great heat wave descended. It was a beautiful day. The sun turned red at three. I started up the mountain and got to the top at four. All those lovely California cottonwoods and eucalypti brooded on all sides. Near the peak there were no more trees, just rocks and grass. Cattle were grazing on the top of the coast. There was the Pacific, a few more foothills away, blue and vast, and with a great wall of white advancing from the legendary potato patch where Frisco fogs are born. Another hour and it would come streaming through the Golden Gate to shroud the romantic city in white, and the young man would hold his girl by the hand and climb slowly up a long white sidewalk with a bottle of toque in his pocket. That was Frisco. And beautiful women standing in white doorways waiting for their men. And Coit Tower and the Embarcadero and Market Street and the eleven teeming hills. I spun around till I was dizzy. I thought I'd fall down as in a dream, clear off the precipice. Oh, where is the girl I love? I thought, and looked everywhere, as I had looked everywhere in the little world below. And before me was the great raw bulge and bulk of my American continent. Somewhere far across, gloomy, crazy New York was throwing up its cloud of dust and brown steam. There is something brown and holy about the East, and California is white like wash lines and empty-headed. At least that's what I thought then.'